The following game was given by Square Enix, free of charge for the purpose of streaming, review, or other such coverage. But that doesn't really factor into any of my opinions. That is included entirely as a matter of disclosure. This was a game that I was highly interested in from previews alone. It looked really good and really pretty. It was in a Nintendo Direct with a lot of other farming games. Of all of them, Harvestella was the one that interested me most. So much so, I applied for the free game code I ended up receiving. I'm pretty anxiety filled and didn't expect to get a code at all to the point I almost didn't apply, but I was so interested in it that I shot my shot. And for taking it, I ended up getting my game of the year. And if you want to see me play games like this, follow my Twitch, twitch.tv slash Wesgalber. Now when people hear someone's game of the year, they tend to complain about why not this game? As if personal opinions need to be defended. To placate any of those people who see this video, let me use the Game Awards list of Game of the Year nominations to illustrate why my choice isn't some kind of problem. I don't own a PlayStation 4 or 5. I did have a 3 before it was broken by a very clumsy cousin like 10 years ago. So God of War and Horizon weren't at all possible to play. I haven't played the first game in either series to begin with. A Plague Tale looks fine enough, but it never interested me. Once again, didn't even play the first game. Elden Ring is on my list of games to play, but I didn't play it yet. It doesn't help that I know a hardcore Souls player who thinks the back half is pretty poorly designed, an opinion that I'd seen other people say as well. Stray was a fun experience I was gifted. It was short, sweet, but didn't knock me out with what it did. You got to be a cat and it did have a message in there that was interesting to follow. Xenoblade Chronicles was pretty good, but the combat is pretty sloppy and the worst of the four games. The story also takes a complete nosedive after the game peaks in Chapter 5. I played and beat 26 games this year as of writing. Only a small handful of these were released this year, unless you count all the Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster titles as well. Of all the games they beat, Chicory A Colorful Tale would be my favorite, but that was released last year and so does not count. So I hope that placates whoever needed that and we can move on to the point of this video, Harvestella. This was a very fun game to experience. I have over 200 hours in Stardew Valley and after a point it started to get pretty old. Most games after 200 hours start getting old. But in the modern day of farming some games, Stardew is the go-to comparison. And honestly, the Harvestella has some improvements over the formula. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's start back at the beginning. When we boot up the game, we see the familiar Square Enix logo, the name all over this, but we also see Livewire. Don't know the name? Do you know Endilily's Quietest of the Nights? It's a game that looks like Child of Light crossed with Hollow Knight, and apparently the comments on the Switch trailer agree. Yes, actually, I thought of that before reading the comments. Basically, every person I know who has played this game, which is only like five at most, seemed to love it. Though I am now curious of the game myself now that I played Harvestella, and I'm sure some of you out there are now interested because of Endililies. Pedigree aside, the title screen immediately brings us beautiful illustrations and music. Every illustration in this game is fantastic and reminds me specifically of the art for the Ivelisse Final Fantasy games. It drew me in, along with the wonderful music. Goshina knocked it out of the park with so many themes. I wish I could tell you to go and listen to the OST online, but I can't find it online beyond the official soundtrack purchase and Apple Music. A lot of the names are spoilery anyway. Otherwise, here's a major mid-game boss track to preview. When this game wants to go hard, it goes hard. Goshina really, really did a good job giving us farm sim themes and epic RPG boss themes. So let's get into the game. We have a basic character creator here, gender choice with some very basic customization. People point this as a major flaw of the game, and I can't inherently disagree. Farming games get a lot of their appeal out of making your own unique character these days. Having such few options is a bit of a shame, though it's not much of an issue for me. I can see why others have a problem with it though. 
Unless they're whining about there being a non-binary option for gender, if they complain about that existing, they can be safely ignored, blacklisted, and ejected from existence. It does prove the point that bigots don't care about inclusivity being in your face or such. They are just evil and don't want it to exist at all. Those idiots aside, wanting more options is hardly a bad call. In the modern age, character customization is highly appreciated, if not becoming overly saturated. And in a farming life sim, I can see people wanting to make a character more like their own. You can make Ayn look different without having many different body types. Face type, maybe an extra hairstyle or two. As far as I can tell, there is no story reason for Ayn to have this one look, but it could be a dev intended design. I don't know. Finishing the creator and giving ourselves a name, we get into the prologue. And things are starting extremely apocalyptic. Everything is dark with ominous music and small lights floating in the air. Some angel girl wakes us from being unconscious in the middle of some town. Trying to talk to people in the houses further contextualizes that everyone fears whatever is going on. The angel girl informs us that we must save the world and a girl. But that to do so, we will need to choose between this world and the one that existed until now. What the hell is going on? Why are we already getting an ultimatum? We don't have long to wonder before we get a shot of a giant glowing crystal and collapse again. This is the beginning of Harvestella. I've never played Rune Factory, but having a farming game go this deep into JRPG tropes this quickly is a definite hook. Usually the ultimatum is given later, and we're not already in the apocalyptic state before the game even starts. Heading towards it, sure, but already there? In a farming game. Which kind of also explains something else you may have noticed. These farming games seem to never have any voice acting. I mean, there's battle lines and one or two lines characters might say when you walk up to them. That's how Harvestella does it. There is a lot of dialogue, but much like your old school RPGs, you will have to read it all yourself. This seemed to be another major split point for players. Whether or not they could handle an RPG without spoken dialogue. As someone who has been playing video games since he was like, five or earlier, I grew up with games that didn't even have the capabilities to have voice acting. And for all the many, many things people have issues with with the new Pokemon games, VA is weirdly something people are pushing back against having, even though it might be a good idea with the cinematic direction it is taking. So be ready to expect old school JRPG and life sim sensibilities. I can't say the game won't do well with more VA, but I'm not going to pretend that VA is needed. Next to Pokemon, the average character interaction and movements are extremely basic. Can really feel that this was a small team with Square Enix support more than anything. Besides, they save the VA for very key moments. And a question I once got was, isn't the intro a key moment? No, no it isn't. And I say that with 100% seriousness. I want to backtrack though to after Dr. Cress leaves you. On your way to follow her, you'll likely see a chest to the side. This is a good carrot to dangle in front of you and tells you instantly that all explorable areas will have treasures to collect, even your own farm. I like subtle tutorials like this. Not only do you come back for it later, but you're exploring to do so. Over in Lethe Village, we get a checkup from the good doctor. She informs us about what we started the game in, Quietus. A mysterious moment between every season where the four seas lights emit particles into the air. This is very dangerous and could kill you. Great, we're already dying. Well, not quite. We are fine, or are until suddenly the skies turn dark. We are now at apocalypse count number two. The seas lights begin to glow and shoot beams of light into the sky. Meteors begin to rain down and crash into the land. Hmm. This seems familiar. But I'm not quite sure what. Investigating the impact site, we find the media as crystal as the sea's light in the background. But with a door. Heading inside, we find someone in armor on the ground. What Cress calls an omen. Much to everyone's apprehension, you end up rescuing the person and bringing them to what will be a new home for the game, Bird's Eye Bray. In the morning, we learn how to farm. Which, if you've played even a single one of these games, you know how it works. Plow the soil, plant the seeds, and water. There's also a bunch of rocks we can get a hammer to break. These rocks are an incentive to get it and upgrade it, since every piece of land we get will have rocks. The effective space you have is reduced until you get it. 
We also have our introduction to stamina, a key part of these games, but also another part people seem split on. Every single action, except jumping, requires stamina. All your farm tools, combat, and even sprinting all take stamina. Which, let's be real, of course it would. The issue is how it affects the gameplay loop. Sprinting is actively discouraged because just watch how much it costs me to sprint as far as I do in this clip. This is one of the smallest areas in the game, and only a small sectioned off part of it. I spent half of my stamina killing enemies and picking up gatherable items on the way to this place and not sprinting. Sprinting back that same distance cost me more than a quarter of my max stamina. Cut the rate in half, and it will feel so much better. Later on in the game, it is fine because of how many resources you have for restoring stamina, but early on you start to be taught to never sprint unless you know you are completely done with stamina for the day. With exceptions for combat, of course. Dodging is important. The game is really, really big, like 100 hours long. I beat the main story on year one, so I didn't even wait around to progress. But that is a lot of game to not want to use sprint for. I did use Sprint a bunch, but even late on when it is a reasonable cost, I felt the cost. So a nicer Sprint cost would definitely improve the game. We also get the daily timer, which is under 20 minutes per day. This seems like a short timer, but it isn't at all. It's more than plenty to make progress through every dungeon, for reasons I'll get to. Time honestly is something you have more of than anything in this game. Only the first day of a season ever tends to push against the daily time limit, because you're often starting from scratch. Anyway, we move into exploring our first battle zone. At the end of the path is two omen, looking very much more conspicuous than the one from the meteor. Dude has two cape things and a bunch of swords on his back? That certainly won't be relevant later. Ending the day, the red omen has their armor begin to glow and speak, then disappear. Inside was a girl who isn't too happy at what she finds. She calls the Seas Light we've been seeing a Red Queen, another one, and claims she is from the future? The distant future at that. She's not going to just sit around and gawk at the world she finds herself in though. Arya, her name we find out is Arya by the way, is a breath of fresh air for JRPG characters. She's competent, but far from a Mary Sue. She's emotional at her predicament and the reasons for her competence make sense. She's abrasive, but still likable. Honestly, she is the best character in the game. I want to go into so much more, but who she is and why she is here is obviously part of the plot. While getting to know Arya, we take a break to learn about skills and job points and a skill tree. In this skill tree, we'll get various buffs and four different skills that a job can use. For now, we only have one because tutorial. I'll hold off on talking about combat a little longer as a result, but know that these skills are a very integral part of the combat. We get an amazingly beautiful shot while Arya laments her lot in life. I have not much else to say beyond that. I just love the bioluminescence of the trees and the Red Queen. Arya is great in this scene, and so is the shot. She figures out what she has to do. Go to the Red Queen, the Autumn Seas Light, herself. Her way home is there, it has to be. Which means we're going to chase after her and get our first dungeon. We head off to Higgin Canyon to see what is up with Arya. Instead, we run into another omen, making it pretty obvious that they're robots. Or at least, that was my first thought. The amount of sparks she's throwing off is a bit much for the armor to be the only robotic thing. We help her out and get our first party member, Dianthus. There's a decent number of party members, but I have a gigantic problem with how they act. It's not that they act slow or generally just low damage output. It's that they don't think on their own. They will only attack if you do. So you could be trying to dodge an enemy that aggroed onto you, but intend to fight, and your ally will just watch. Given the nature of some of the encounters of this game, the fear system, I guess it makes sense, but I'd have preferred some kind of toggle for those enemies. Fears, your allies would only attack when prompted by your own strike. Random mobs in the field? Let them go in first. The fear system is basically gigantic mobs that you will need to avoid until you come back to them later. If you've ever played Etrian Odyssey or Persona Q, it's a lot like that system. If you even attempt to fight these enemies, you will get bodied several times over. So for the duration of the dungeon, there's special enemy obstacles that might patrol an area or otherwise force you down a different path. If your allies went after these with no regard to their own safety, 
Sure, that would be absolutely awful game design, but they went too far in the other direction. It ends up being probably my single biggest gripe with the game. I actually can forgive the stamina system VA, the fact there's no real PC options because they obviously put this on the Switch before PC. Everything else, before the way allies just stand around being worthless. But as for the dungeon itself, Higgin Cannon is a very good introduction. It looks pretty, has the least threatening fears in the game, and teaches most of the mechanics you need for the rest of the game. It also much further develops the story in a way that you will be confused about for a long while. Like random ruins, and robots teleporting out and into the sea's light. Which makes Apocalypse Count number 3, by the way. It's a hat trick! Time, and sort of stamina, is way less of an issue than it would otherwise be thanks to the shortcut system. Every dungeon has shortcuts placed pretty often, or designed with paths you go down only once to get a key of some kind. So you never need to repeat the same paths over and over, and just sprint past everything to get further. First, we have ladders and bridges, repairable pathways you can make when you reach the appropriate spots. It costs one hour of game time, or about one minute of exploration, to instantly build the shortcut. If it took five minutes to get to this shortcut, you are spending an extra minute now, so all future visits have a shorter trip. This makes even the shortest, most basic dungeon trip a potential progress trip. If you could finish a dungeon map in one day, you could spend half the day exploring, doing other objectives, and then do half the map with the other half saved for tomorrow with no progress lost. It makes any and all stress that comes with the timer non-existent. A slow explorer will still make progress every trip. Secondly, we have monolites. We only finally get the manual save option halfway into the dungeon, which is one of three uses they have. One use we'll get and talk about later, the other is fast travel within a dungeon and the overworld. Monolites will allow you to travel to any other monolite you have activated within the same area, usually one per map of a dungeon, with dungeons having multiple maps. Towns will have three or four placed around. So not only did you not need to run through paths you completed outside of farming EXP or drops, but entire maps could be skipped once completed. It honestly takes away all the stress of exploring under a time limit. There's so many shortcuts that you'll be hard pressed to run up against the time limit. Ever. Oh, and any monolite also acts as a fast travel back to your house from anywhere in the world. So even if you're hitting the end of a day and don't have time to travel the overworld to your house, you can just teleport home for free. It's all just so convenient and makes even the RPG side pretty chill. Well, mostly. It's still an RPG with combat, so you're not going to be able to laze around. This includes the midpoint of the dungeon, where we get to meet Unicorn, our first boss. Basically, he's Kieran from Monster Hunter. But also, you'll immediately be thrown into having a red circle under you. This is a silent tutorial that bosses have AoE indicators. They will have basic attacks that don't have an indicator, but many attacks will have indicators. Any Final Fantasy XIV or general MMO player will be very used to these existing. You're taught to dodge without any tutorial on what AoE indicators are. I like that. Going further, we do have the Monolite tutorial, and the tutorial for having multiple jobs. You can equip up to three, and they're all very different. Obvious with our base job being a sword user with a flame strike and a mage that has ice and lightning attacks. There's a whole 12 jobs, and they really do all feel different, for better or worse. Looking at you, Hein. But let's skip up to the boss before discussing the combat. We find Arya unconscious at the sea's light when Hithlodeus comes out of the crystal. She intends to kidnap Arya for unknown reasons, and so fights against us for their leader, Geist, who Dianthus apparently knows, being an omen and all. And so we fight! We learn about the break system, which is where a lot of the depth of the combat comes in. Every boss monster, including Fears, has four weaknesses. Exploiting weaknesses will cause the enemy to break and take increased damage. You can also double break, increasing damage even further and causing the break to last longer. Adding a triple break or even quad break will not increase damage any further, but it will increase the length of time the boss is broken. It also allows for super attacks. Every party member has a special attack they can use after you reach a level of closeness with them, doing their side quests basically. This will either cause a huge amount of damage, debuff them, buff your party, heal your party, or some mix of these elements. These are only available under a double break of two adjacent weaknesses, but hitting a triple break where all three are connected with no space between them will automatically refresh the super attack, quad break, and you can get a third super attack. 
So not only do you want to abuse weaknesses, you want to abuse them in a specific order. There is, however, an issue with this. Depending on your progress in the game, you may not have the weakness of a boss. Maybe you'll have some of the consumable orb items of which there are a few of, but run out of those items and that break is done for for the rest of the fight. No more abusing it even if you tried. I believe there's only one boss that actively comes to mind that is outright impossible to quad break them, but it could be impossible because you did not bring the jobs you need. Typically a job will only have two elements, of which there are a lot of them. We have Slash, Crush, Piercing, Wave, Sage, Fire, Water, Wind, Ice, Earth, Lightning, Poison. That is 12 different weaknesses. And while your team does help and you could spread your weaknesses you have available with them, they don't do that much. Which means you will have only up to half of the possible weaknesses of any specific boss. This could mean you actively do not have any way to double break a boss. Sure, you might have one or two weaknesses, but adjacent, high chance you can't double it. It very much doesn't help there is no real way to tell ahead of time. Oh, it's boss time. What is this boss weak to? It's a water boss. It's weak to earth and wave. Wave sounds something water-based, and earth is actively something you might expect to be weak to water. Many bosses you won't even see coming. As a result, you'll have to kill some bosses the slow way and without your super cool moves. It also doesn't help that you might not like a job. I believe the only job with a wave skill is the wog... woglet... woglind... wog... wog... woglind? That job? So if you don't use woglind, you have no way to do any wave damage. And wave doesn't have an orb item. It's great to make me want to strategize and have as many weaknesses as I can, but there's a limit that was just slightly passed over. Maybe they're expecting players to die more? Death is extremely lenient in this game. Even when I died to the final boss, all I had was Crest make me pay a small pittance and I woke up late the next day. Sure, any items I spent during the encounter will be gone, but the losses are still so small. So going into a boss, seeing I have the wrong elements and dying would make the system make a bit more sense. But in total, I think I died maybe three, four times total the whole game. And as I said, once was on the final boss. One or two of them were post-game deaths, meaning only one death was before the final boss. I don't consider myself all that great at games on average. I'm good, but I'm closer to average probably. Though I also have a self-deprecation problem. Either way, I didn't at all struggle. The bosses can be a good challenge, not to say this game is a pushover, but it's generally pretty feasible for any player to force through, even with a little bit of prep. A little tangential, I know, but maybe death was a bit more core to the loop than I experienced. Back to the combat system, Beyond Break is the prep I mentioned. All the items you could bring, healing items, stamina regens, orbs, and your job choices. You can bring three jobs into any encounter. That's three of 12 different jobs with up to four attacks in the end game. For most of the game, you'll have two or three, with the fourth skill being at the end of the skill trees, and essentially ultimate attack. Each skill and swapping between jobs all has cooldowns that you can shorten with investing more time into each job. It doesn't do much for making you want to invest time in jobs you don't like, like the mechanic job. All of its skills just feel extremely terrible to me. I've seen people on forums say they actually like the job. Meanwhile, I don't think I used the job a single time after completing the chapter it is from, excluding post-game grinding to max it out just for the sake of it. It also means that any new job you do like is a power loss for a bit. You start with only basic attacks and one skill. Later on in the game, you earn job points so fast it doesn't matter for long, so even late game jobs are pretty viable in that way. I can't say it was a bad idea in the inclusion of this leveling system, but I feel there could have been some improvements made here. Overall though, the combat is simple but satisfying. You could boil it down to spam skills, swap to the next job, and repeat, but in my hands, I thought about what job I wanted for each encounter or each moment of an encounter. This encounter has three ranged enemies. I should swap to the mage with a big nuke attack to start the fight with, then swap to the next and finish them off. With bosses asking you to actively dodge and counter when there is an opening, certain jobs can better take advantage of these openings. It's simple enough, 
but has enough there for a more experienced RPG fan to customize and react to, but still basic enough that a more casual player won't be too lost. Using our new tools, we take down Hithlodeus and Dianthus goes into the Sea's Light. The quakes that started before the fight are calmed down by this act. What was done? Who knows? You and Unicorn take Arya back home and call it a night. So ends Chapter 2 of the game, and opens Chapter 3 with the Angel Girl in what seems like an infinite beach line. She remains cryptic as ever. This world is nothing but an image you've conjured in your own mind. As in heaven and hell, they are whatever you make of them. Like, yeah, thanks for telling me that right before we have the third apocalypse. Quietus has started early due to the previous day's events, but luckily a pair of legs is in your farm protecting it. Be sure to bury it and never deal with it again. Okay, not really. That pair of legs is actually a fairy. The Great Fire Fairy, as she calls herself. Also known as the Autumn Fairy, since you just completed the dungeon of the Autumn Sea's Light. You and her strike up a pact, which involves naming her yourself. I named her Aerie. If you know, you know. Part of this pact is that you will go rescue the other three fairies, which means going to the other Sea's Lights and solving whatever problems are going on there. This is where the game opens, and is by far the game's longest chapter. Investigating in Lethe, you find Asshole, Hein, and Shirika. Each one is from the three towns with the Seas Lights. Each subchapter goes the same. Meet two party members, deal with the troubles of the Seas Light, and learn a bit of the plot along the way. Your reward, beyond party members, substories, and party member stories, is another fairy to your farm. Each one unlocking more pages of this book that Aerie puts in your house. Doing more tasks unlocks more objects and abilities. This includes reducing stamina costs for your farm activities, or even opening entirely new parts of the farm. A water biome and a cave biome. The ability to charge tools to have a bigger effect. Even pick up crops in a larger area. This is a really good progression system, but I feel like there's a bit of a strange priority within this system. One of the rewards is recipes to craft stuff like kegs. There are three levels of each of these. The problem is... Level 3 for most of these objects is from completing an entire fairy's page. One of the tasks is literally only possible to do in the post-game. Literally impossible to do until you have beaten the main story. This is such a task that I actually completed everything else first. I had all the money I could ever need, all my weapons completely upgraded. There was nothing more to buy or make new. This isn't like Stardew where you could get the gold clock or customize your giant farm. You have a few hundred tiles of farm, but that's still smaller than Stardew's smallest farm of over 1400 tiles of farmable space. You even do get stuff like fences to make your farm prettier. Again, I actively love this system of progression. It incentivizes you to spread out your activities, not just go with whatever crop is the most profitable or meta. High-end Stardew tends to be spamming starfruit in the greenhouse with one seasonal crop you take care of besides. Sure, there's the community center, but that only ever needs one of a specific item. Here, yeah, there's a stamp for one of an item, and 10, and 50, and 100, and 150. Even on a second playthrough when you know, oh, onions are more profitable than carrots or anything else, you will still put effort into carrots to try and tick every box before the season turns. It was so close to being perfect. It isn't just collecting crops either. There's making sure you have trees, or engaging with all the RPG content, upgrading weapons, doing side quests. I actively do like this system more than Stardew's. Give it another pass and it will have actively done something better than what is currently the top farm sim people look to. Well, besides the combat but that wasn't hard. Regardless, this is where the game opens up and where I'll stop the step-by-step -step commentating. Now becomes where you fully dive into the loop of taking care of your farm day-to-day -day before heading out to make progress in the RPG side. Unravel the mystery of Quietus as you expand the farm, get animals, and improve your combat capabilities. Maybe even explore that strange well in the farm. There's a topic or two I want to cover before I call it quits for now. One thing has to do with stamina issues, one thing that bothered me personally, and one weird thing with the discourse comparing this to Stardew. Food. There's a cooking side to this game. I like it quite a bit that there's a food delivery objective you can do. Gets you more recipes and a lot of gorilla. Oh, uh, gorilla is what I called the money. It's very much worth investing into if just for those turn-ins. 
but there's two other major benefits to food that need retooling. First is the stamina gains. Food can regain anywhere from like half of your max stamina to all of it. Food also fills your belly, which is a meter to the right. While your belly has food in it, stamina regens. But this ends up being a way to prevent you from spamming food over and over. They heal, but you're meant to use other items for healing. Your average cooked meal will fill your belly 20 to 30 percent. If you're sprinting around and fighting enemies, you're going to drain your stamina back down to zero before even half of that fullness is spent, which means you'll be eating another 20 to 30 percent filling meal soon after. Now because days are short this isn't too big a deal, even eating basic meals to keep your stamina topped, you'll be able to make large swaths of dungeon progression every day without filling. But it still feels off in a way, even when you aren't finding issue with it actively. There's a loss version there. You fear hitting that cap and being unable to eat until your belly empties a little. The chance it'll ever be an active issue, like mid-combat you're gonna need a meal and can't? Not something I ever came close to, but it's an attitude I've seen others have too. The other big issue with food is the buffs. Most, if not all, meals come with some sort of buff. Which, yeah, that's fine, good even. It incentivizes actually eating food regardless of that loss aversion. You're gonna get buffs that last for like a minute. Sure, you can do a lot of damage in one minute or however long the actual buff timer is, but there's a further issue. Break time. You unlock the ability to have meal breaks at Monolites once a day. You'll get a nice scene where your party discusses the meal you ate. This is like those active time discussions in Tales of games. This increases the effectiveness of buffs quite a bit, but for seemingly no time benefit. It still fills your belly and doesn't last any longer, so why bother unless you're about to fight a boss? Not every day will give you a boss fight. Later dungeons especially get very long. There's exploration involved, so a lot of empty time where you aren't fighting, wasting your buff's timer. I have no reason to use these buffs actively when they're so short. It's hard to tell when they wear off if you aren't staring at your status bar, so refreshing them isn't even an option. If I were to improve the system, I'd make the buff last all day, provided you don't override it with another buff of the same type if you want to try to balance it to not be overpowered. But given how strong bosses can be, I don't think it would be even overpowered. Let me start every dungeon crawl with a buff to help me through. I'm already giving myself a stamina penalty. The difficulty or cost of meals itself is a balancing feature as well. Anything that uses rare fish kind of balances itself since some of those fish are extremely rare. Or the recipes with pumpkins or watermelons. Or premium meat. There's so much in the way of specific meals you might very much want to use that deciding to use the buff on a given day is enough of a punishment in itself. Not that it even needs a punishment beyond consumption. You used a limited resource. That's all it needs to be. It's a strategic choice you made. It being such a minor benefit with the normal downsides to consuming a meal, this is a feature I just never used. Ever. I used it once when I learned about it, and maybe one other time before a boss. That's when I realized the buffs were still very short. Secondly is the thing that bothered me. A lot of side questing is kind of one note. Not that the quests themselves are boring, but they almost exclusively cover one or two topics and have similar happy endings. Like, most side quests are about love or family. I believe only a single quest actually ended with an unhappy ending. Now of course happy endings feel nice, but this is a world where an apocalypse happens every season turn. It's such a problem even that Cress's side story is all about treating the disease caused by Quietus, and it's in these character side stories they seem to give a variety of feelings. Side quests you might feel sad at points, but will ultimately get a happy end. Treating an impossible to cure disease? Sounds like a beating the odd story at best. 
But when every other side quest has an ending of, Oh, I love my family. Family is great. It gets a bit on the nerves. Especially for those of us who kind of do not have that kind of environment. It comes across as preachy for what is otherwise a game with so much more complexity and nuance. Like, there's literally an orphanage in the game. Even the saddest quest about orphans is all that sweet by the end. Like I said, it's a thing that personally bothered me. You might be able to easily overlook it if you're anyone else. Finally, we have the talk that Stardew Valley had so much more complexity in the farming and that... confuses me? Maybe it's due to the argument being poorly framed, but it's about as complex, I would say. There's fewer animal types, but every chicken type animal worked the same. I guess cow versus sheep versus pig was the part that they mean? I didn't treat these any different to the rest. It just meant I needed a chest with shears and a bucket at the barn. And make sure pigs have a large space to get truffles. When it comes to crops, the only thing Stardew has is fertilizer, which I never used. And the chance for I think a whole three crops to become giant? Cauliflower, melons, and pumpkins. It's only a 1% chance according to the wiki, and in some you're just going to spam starfruit. Unless they rebalanced values to make it worth going for large crops. Maybe it's a matter of number of options rather than complexity? There's a much larger variety of crops in Stardew Valley, or at least feels like there are. There's complexity Stardew has that Harvestella doesn't, but it is with the stuff around the farming, not the farming itself. I only bring this all up because I'm sure even Concerned to Ape would agree, probably critiquing and comparing the games is how you move a genre forward. He didn't make Stardew Valley for no reason, made it essentially a life's passion. If you want a genre to move forward, you have to try and point out why you think one thing is more or less complex, not just state that it is. There's plenty that the game could do more of or improve. No game is perfect. Let's see what we can learn from this one's mistakes. And that's Harvestella, a quirky blend between farming and JRPG. I believe it is far better than what people give it credit for. There's a lot to love. It also has a goat hamster fox horse thing. You can even pet the goat hamster fox horse thing. And all your other animals. Still not convinced about Harvestella? Still think it isn't worth it? Well, let me show you a no-context spoiler meme I found on Tumblr. I added something to it of my own, but only one small thing at the bottom. You ready? This is Harvestella. And yes, this picture is 100% accurate. Wanna know how? Then play the game for yourself. For all my issues with the game, for all the problems it has, for all the releases I did play this year, this was easily my favorite game of the year. No game is perfect, and your willingness to critique and criticize your favorite game is a true show of you care for it. I criticize because I care. If Livewire want to make a Harvestella 2, or are ordered to by Square, I want to see them make something even greater. I want to play that game, I want to dive in, enjoy some relaxing farming, and then feel emotional over a fully fleshed JRPG story. Maybe next time Creative Business Unit 3 can get in on the action now that Final Fantasy 16 is on the way out. And that is why my 2022 Game of the Year is Harvestella. Thanks for watching me talk about and critique Harvestella. I want to emphasize, this is the year of Vampire Survivors and I have almost 100 hours in that. Still put Harvestella above it. This game was super good to me. This was 40 minutes long and I basically skipped over some topics or barely covered them. And go look back at that meme. I barely covered the game. As I said, join me on Twitch for other gaming, follow my socials, like, comment, and sub. Thanks for watching, take care, and may the power of Anadid Hogs lay waste to your enemies. And of course, the extra special thanks to my patrons over on Patreon, with the even further thanks going out to... Ashtree Dweller, Eamon al Khatib, Benjamin Hahn, Benjamin Haynes, Benjamin Rice, Cerex, Ethan Olson, Ethan W, Frasier97, James Hall, Jericho, Kevin Lowe, Mizella, Nick Griffin, T Rogue, Timmy, and Zero Two. Thank you all for the support, for watching, and see ya in 2023.